chapter 6. We were in the same portion of scripture last Sunday morning and we looked at one or two things that we saw there and I said we would uh, finish, God willing, we'd finish it today. So we're gathering again around 2 Kings chapter 6. We're going to read the same verses, verses 1 to 7 please. 2 Kings chapter 6, beginning to read in verse 1. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us, too small for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither. And the iron did swim. Therefore said he, take it up to thee, and he put out his hand, and he took it. Ending there, and again just looking to the Lord for his blessing upon his own truth. Let me just refresh your memory very, very briefly, very quickly for just a moment. As we began uh, to our thoughts on these verses of Scripture uh, last week, we, we were looking at it under the title quite simply of the cutting edge. We were thinking about losing, how we can lose that cutting edge. And we just highlighted last Sunday that the school of the prophets or the place where the school met had become too, first of all, too small for them to meet in. And so the decision is made to go to Jordan and to cut down some trees and to build something that was bigger, something that was better. And in conjunction with that, we looked at various thoughts. We saw how they were a pleasant group of people, a people with a warm welcome. We saw how they were all willing workers. Let us go, we pray thee unto Jordan, verse 2 says. They were all willing workers, all willing to put their hand to the work and to get involved. And then we looked at the one who spoke to his master. They desired the presence of their master with them. And after that, we got on to the axe head and we looked at the one who lost his axe head. A couple of things very quickly that we just highlighted about him. He lost the power or he lost the cutting edge that he needed to be able to carry out the work that they were involved in. And we saw not only that he lost his cutting edge, but that he lost it even while he was busy in the work, while he was busy laboring. It was a time of service. Listen, it was a time of growth even, and it was a time of expansion. And yet in the midst of that, this individual lost his cutting edge. And then finally last week we saw that he lost that which was not his own. Verse 5 tells us it was borrowed. And so in connection with all of that, of course, the question arises. The question quite simply is, what about our cutting edge? What about your cutting edge in the work of God? Is it still as sharp? Is it still as effective for the Lord? as it perhaps once was. And this morning, as we pick up our thoughts on all of these verses, we need to be asking ourselves that question. What about my cutting edge? Listen, don't you worry about the person beside you, or in front of you, or behind you. What about your, what about my cutting edge this morning? I often think whenever I look after myself, I'll have plenty to look after. I'll have enough to answer for on that day whenever I answer for myself without worrying about other people. Every man will give an account of himself. And so we need to be asking each one of us, ourselves, that question. What about my cutting edge? Because, friends, we are living in days and we are living at a time, and I've said this to you before, when we need to be sharp for the Lord. Amen. Can you agree with that? We need to be sharp for the Lord. We need to be at our very best in these days of time. Days whenever there is so much antagonism and so much opposition to the work of God, even to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Days whenever people deny the very existence of God. Days whenever people will go after anything but God. And people go today after all kinds of spiritual things. But they will not go after the Father of Spirits. Why is that? And so we need to be at our very best in these days of time. Sharp. Sharp age. We need to be at our best. Friends, Jesus is coming soon. Do you believe that? Of course he is. And listen, all we've got to do is look around us. And that's pretty obvious. But here's the thing. When he comes, all opportunities will then be gone. And so you and I need to be taking every opportunity. We need to be close. We need to be sharp with that cutting edge that we're able to take every single opportunity that he brings our way in order to be a part of the work. These people were involved in the work of God. And if we're to be a part of the work, we need to be sharp. And so what is your cutting edge like for God? So with that in mind, let's pick up again on these verses that we see here. Because we've highlighted the things that we touched on last week. And the next thing that we see here again is that this man lost his axe head. He lost his cutting edge. He was painfully aware of his loss. Painfully aware of his loss. Now please understand this. He didn't lose the handle. He still knew how. He still had the knowledge. He still knew how to cut trees down. But he lost that effectiveness. He lost that cutting edge. And he was so painfully aware of it. You see, you could be sitting here this morning and you could have lost the sharpness of that cutting edge. But you still know how you're supposed to go about winning souls. You still know how you're supposed to witness for the Lord. You still know how to share that word of witness for the Lord. But you're painfully aware of the fact that the cutting edge is no longer there. And you see, that's how he found himself. Verse 5. Let me read it to you again. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. He was all too painfully aware of his loss. He knew that he had lost it. He immediately knew that something was wrong. And coupled with that, he also knew that further effort in the work on his part was completely useless. Useless. You know, it's sad that so many try to carry on in the work and in their witness for God even whenever they know that the power, that the anointing is gone. And friends, people think others don't realize it or don't see it, but they do. Here's a man, and he, he was aware that he had lost his effectiveness. And he knew immediately that to try and proceed or to try and, and continue to be active in the work was completely futile. It would be completely useless. And yet we live in days in the church whenever we have lost the cutting edge, friends. Whether we care to admit it or whether we don't, we have lost the cutting edge. And I've said to you before, the church grinds on and on and on and on. And we have great evidence today that we've lost the cutting edge. Because we have substituted for the power that God alone can give. We have substituted that with the best that man can do. And our churches are full of it. And things are good and organized well and put together well and planned well. But where's God? Where's God in it all? And you see, we've substituted the power that God alone can give. Because we've lost that age. And we've replaced it with something of our own making. We're doing the very best that we can do. And the results are disaster. They are disaster. And so we witness to others. And they hear our words. And they look at our lives. They look at the lives of people in the church, professing Christian people in the church, and they say, if that's Christianity, who needs that nonsense? Who needs that junk? Because there's no real power and evidence within the life, or evident within the life. And they look at the church, and the church seems to be completely irrelevant from the pulpits of our land. 
We hear good sermons. Sermons well put together. You know, if you go to Bible college, they'll tell you how you should preach. You know, three-point sermon, expository preaching. Give a point. Give three points within that point. Give your next point. Give three points within that point. Give your next point. Give three points within that point. You know what to say to us? People will remember it because it's an organized sermon. If you're listening for organized sermons for me, you'll listen for a long time. Because you know what I've discovered in life, friends? I remember stuff that God says to me. And in the midst of every sermon that I've ever heard preached, there's been times whenever it wasn't how well the sermon was put together or how good the oratory was or anything else. It was the fact that God was in it. And I've said to you before, if I tell you something, you'll forget it. If God tells you something, you'll never forget it. And you see, that's what's wrong in church life today. The best that man can do. The best that man can give. But the power of God, the cutting edge in the work of God, is no longer present in the church. And so we have sermons that lack power. And again, let me say it, in the eyes of the world around us, the church is completely irrelevant. I had someone who said, I'm not going to tell you what church they said it about. I'm not even going to tell you who it was said it to me. But I had someone who said to me lately of a certain church that the gospel that's preached there is so timid. That was the word that was used to me. So timid that it wouldn't touch anything. Friend, you're very quiet. But you know exactly what I'm saying, don't you? Because this is truth. This is where we're living our church life at. In the midst of stuff that has lost something and still it grinds on and grinds on because that's the thing that we always do. Some of you may be here this morning because this is the thing that we always do. And I'm not saying that to be spiteful, but perhaps that's why you're here. I don't know your heart, but the Lord does. The Lord does. And you see, we need to look at all of this stuff. And what, what is our age? What is the power? Are we really, really here to touch Jesus with our thanks and praise? Are we really here to worship him for all that he has done for us? Or are we here because this is Sunday? Now you can determine that in your own heart. And determine that in your own life. Friends, no amount of eloquence, and you'll not get it from this pulpit while I'm here. Or no amount of earnestness, you will get that. Or no amount of good intentions or busyness will ever make up for the loss of the keen cutting edge of spiritual power. Because that's the bottom. That's where it happens. That's where it's all at. We need this cutting edge of spiritual power. If this man had gone on swinging his headless handle as if nothing had happened, the others would have looked upon him as someone who was completely beside himself. And yet in church life, the stuff still grinds on. And is it any wonder the world looks at us and thinks we're beside ourselves? Because there's never any real evidence of the power of God. There's never anything there that really cuts into their lives to make them stop and look and realize there is something about this that I'm missing out on. But this man stopped because he was too painfully aware of, of what had happened. And you see, only a fool would keep on chopping at a tree whenever there's no axe head on the shaft. And anybody would know that. You don't need me to tell you that. But in spiritual things, we try to keep on going. Friends, when will we learn that we need to stop and we need to examine ourselves and we need to examine our methods. Because without that power, our work will be completely fruitless. You don't need me to tell you that today. Whenever the Lord Jesus Christ was about to leave his disciples, and he was about to ascend onto the right hand of his Father in glory, he told them in Acts chapter 1 verse 4 that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which said he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, he said, not many days hence. He told them to wait for that. 
And he told them that was a promise from the Father that they were to stand upon and wait for. And then in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, he says, For you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And he says, You will be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. That's his promise. There's a power that's there. There's a cutting edge that comes. There's a power that's available to make you and me fruitful in the kingdom of Almighty God. And they went. They obeyed him. They tarried. They waited on that promise. And your story no goes, you know it as well as I do. On the day of Pentecost, when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, the first sermon that was preached, and it wasn't preached in tongues either. They come out and they, they spoke in tongues. They glorified God. They talked about the great things that God had done in the world. And then it says, Peter standing up in the midst of them. He preaches this sermon in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the Aramaic language that would have been there in that day. Not in tongues, but in the language that everyone also would have understood. And three thousand souls got saved. Amen. And the next sermon that was preached, five thousand souls got saved. Praise God. What a glory. Why? Because Peter, an uneducated man, wasn't eloquent. He wasn't trained in ministry. He wasn't trained how to do this. No, friends, listen. He just went out with a cutting edge for God. And God did the rest. God did the work. It says in Acts chapter 4 verse 33, With great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace. I love that. Great grace was upon them all. And on another occasion it says, These people that have turned the world upside down have come here as well. I would to God that people would say that about the church today. I really mean that. I just wish that that was true today. That we were turning the world upside down with our preaching. With our lives for Christ. With the cutting edge of conviction and power that was upon those who profess the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I include myself in that too, by the way. If only. You see, friends, they had a cutting edge for Christ that we know nothing of. And they had it because the Holy Ghost was upon them in power. Hallelujah. And can I say to you this morning, if you have ever known that power in your life, but it's not there anymore, or it's not the same anymore, you will know it. Just like this man knew that he had lost his axe head. And let me say, if that is the case this morning, it's time to stop, because our own efforts are, as I've said, are fruitless. And completely useless. This man was painfully aware of his loss. But let's move it a little bit further for a moment. Because next we see that this man immediately appealed to his master. Alas, verse 5, alas, master. To whom else could he go? Where else could he get the help that he needed? He turned to his master in the Lord, the man of God. If the man of God couldn't help him, who could? Well, folks, listen. If the cutting edge is gone, and if the cutting edge is, or if the cutting edge is blunt, if that's your situation today, there's no point sitting down trying to content yourself with the thought, ah, it couldn't be helped. Because some people, I know people who do that. And they are not what they used to be in Christ. And they are not what they should be in Christ because of perhaps certain things that have happened to them. And they, they sit with pity and they sit with regret and they look back over their lives and say, I'm not what I used to be, but it can't be helped. You're sitting blank. <laughs> Let me say this to you. Some people will say, ah, oh, the devil did that to me. I was going well for God. The devil came along. Boy, he, uh, he, he, just, he just took the feet from under me. He cut me down. The devil defeated me. 
Or there are older people and they'll say, ah, but you don't know the problems that I went through. You don't know what I had to contend with. And during that time, I just lost out with God. And it can't be helped. It's all in the past. Or there are other people. And they say, ah, but you don't know what those people in that church did to me. You ever heard that one? It's in every church in the country. And I just, you know, I, I just, it just got on top of me. And I couldn't be what I need to be among those people. Or I couldn't be what I need to be anymore because of what those people did to me. And, you know, I, I've just got to be content because this is, my, this is the cross I have to carry. And it couldn't be any further from the cross, to be honest, because that's not what even carrying a cross means. But people content themselves with that. And that's what they'll say. And people will use every possible excuse to make argument for why they are where they are and not where they should be. Oh, it can't be helped. I want to tell you today, praise God, it can be helped. Hallelujah. It can be helped. Alas, Master. Friend, listen, if that's your situation today, and I'm maybe not speaking to everybody in this congregation today, I might be speaking to one person, I don't know. Maybe two people, I don't know. But I'm saying this to you today, if that is your situation today, cry aloud, alas, Master, take it to the Lord in prayer. Stop where you are, stop what you're doing, and get before God in prayer. Bring it before Him. Tell Him all about it. Tell him that you've lost that cutting edge. Confess how you feel. Confess maybe what happened to you. What you came through. How you felt about it. How you responded to it. The reason that you are where you are. Bring it before him in prayer and confess it to him. You've lost that edge that enabled you to win souls. And tell him that you need that power back. That you need that replaced in your life. You know, whenever Samson, and we touched on Samson last week, and you know the story, they cut his hair, and he awoke, and he didn't realize the Holy Spirit was gone. And they took him, and they bound him, and they poked the eyes out of him, and he was down in the prison in Gaza, and he was grinding the mill, he was pushing the big millstone round. And the Bible tells us as time went on, Samson came to a time in his experience. Listen, he was painfully aware of what he had lost. How could he not be? But he came to a time in his experience and he prayed, oh, listen to this, oh, Lord God, remember me. Remember me, I pray thee. And strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, oh God. And you know that story as well. And the power, that power that he had lost, That cutting edge that he had had as a judge amongst God's people and as a voice for God against the enemies of God's people. That power that he had lost, it returned. And he took hold of the pillars of the temple on which he stood and he tore the entire building to the ground. Why? Because he cried unto his Lord and his master. Give me back, Lord, what I've lost. Replace The Bible says he killed more in his death than he killed in his lifetime. He did greater things in that final moment than he had done all of the previous years that he had lived. Why? Because he called upon God for his power. And he brought the building down. You know, friends, we need to learn to take it to the Lord in prayer. And we need to learn how to talk to God plainly in prayer just to tell him all about it. And the lovely thing is, he will restore that which we need for the glory of his great name. For the glory of his name. This man immediately appealed to his master. Alas, master. He was painfully aware that he had lost something, and he immediately appealed to his master. And then we see finally, that what he had lost, he had miraculously restored. Let me read you verses 6 and 7 again. And the man of God said, where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. 
Therefore said he, take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and he took it. I want you to see two things in those verses. Two things that are worth noting. First of all, he got it where he lost it. He got it back where he had lost it. There was no other place where he could find it. And you see, folks, sometimes we lose that that cutting edge in our lives. And yet we will run to all kinds of things, looking, trying to get it back again. And there's no good looking for it by listening to some better preacher. And there's no good looking for it by running here and there, trying to, to, to get into the presence of God somewhere. And people will do all kinds of things in an effort to try and regain what they've lost. Listen, if you've lost it, you'll get it back where you lost it at. It's as simple as that. There was no point in taking Elisha 100 yards upstream. We'll say this is upstream. There's no point in taking Elisha 100 yards upstream whenever he had lost the axe head down there. Isn't that right? We're foolish. And yet we'll go looking for stuff that we once had, or we'll go looking for stuff that we once saw that we need, had need of, and we'll go looking for it in places where it just cannot be found. And by the way, don't take that up wrong. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with listening to sermons, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with going to all our meetings. That's not what that's about. But I'm just saying that if you have lost it, you will only get it back where you lost it at. You see, if it has been lost through worldliness on your part, or if it has been lost through some reaction to something that somebody said to you. Or if it has been lost through some strife or some spite that you're holding in your head. Either against God because of some situation. Or against people because something that they put you through. If that's where you lost it through that. That's the place you've got to get back to to find it again. And all the sermons in the world or all the good meetings in the world. Are not going to help you to restore it or regain it. You've got to go back. To where you lost it at. And you will find your lost power back at the place you lost it. And if you've lost it today, you'll know exactly where that's at. And it might be through lack of prayer on your own part. Or it might be through some hurt or some trial or some problem. Or some busyness in life that just got you away from God. But wherever you lost it at, you'll know it. And that's the place you've got to get back to. If you want to regain it. Back to the place where you went on in your own way and you went on in your own wisdom and strength and you denied the Holy Spirit or the power of God. You won't find it in any other place. You see, he asks him here, he goes to the man of God, alas, master, and the first thing he says to him, where did it fall at? Where fell it? Verse 6. Confess where it went in at. Confess where you lost it at. Where did I lose it? And I said, let me say it again. If you've lost it, then you will know where. You will know exactly where. Maybe some action, maybe some attitude. Maybe some relationship. Maybe some decision that you made. Maybe some reaction, as I said, to a hurt. Or maybe some failure to do what the Lord had been telling you to do. Whatever the reason, where fell it? You need to get back there to find it again. Because it's only by going back there and dealing with that that you will have that cutting edge, that power, that zeal, that anointing restored. That's the first thing. Where fell it at? Where fell it? He got it where he lost it. The second thing is this. He got it back through a miracle. A miracle. Verse 17. It says, sorry, verse 7, I beg your pardon. Therefore said he, take it up to thee, and he put out his hand, and he took it. Tells us in the previous verse that Elisha cast a stick in where it fell. Listen to me. And it says the iron did swim. Now please forgive me. Your new King James says the iron floated. That's a bad translation. That's a bad translation. It says the iron did swim. It did swim. You see, if you think about the shaft and you think about the axe head, you think about the stick that was thrown into the water and you think about the axe head. Friends, there are two kingdoms there. 
two kingdoms. You see, iron belongs to the mineral kingdom. Isn't that right? Wood belongs to the vegetable, the organic kingdom. And you see, what a lesson we see here. And it's a lesson of our union with Christ. Whenever the iron from one kingdom or the iron from one nature was separated from the wood of another kingdom or the wood of another nature, the whole process became absolutely useless. Useless. You see, nothing must be allowed to come in between the Lord and us to separate us. See what I'm trying to say there? Nothing. No one. No thing must be allowed. Jesus said on one occasion, he says if you don't hate your father and your mother and your brothers and sisters, he said if you don't love me more than them, you're not fit for the kingdom. And yet so often we let so many things get in our way between us and the Lord Jesus Christ. But whenever the two kingdoms, whenever the two natures are divided here, the wood from the, the, the cutting from the, from the iron, whenever the two kingdoms and the two natures are separated, the whole process dies dismally. And nothing must be allowed to come in between the Lord and us to separate us. Jesus says, without me, he says, you can do nothing. And in John chapter 15, where he's speaking about the vine, and he says, I'm the true vine, and he says, you are the branches. He goes on, and we're not going to quote all of that, but he says, it's as we abide in him, it's as our union in Christ is everything that it should be that will bear much fruit. That's his word. As we abide in him. You see, friends, if we're separated from him, if we are left to ourselves, we shall sink. Amen. Of course we will. If we're left to ourselves, we'll sink and we'll be completely useless. And you see, there is always the downward pull of the kingdom that we are from. Always that downward pull of the kingdom that we've come from. And there's always something in your old nature and mine to answer to that downward pull. Always. And so we must be sure that we're abiding in the vine. Abiding in union with the vine. That that nature of ours is always continually, that kingdom that we have been brought out of has been drawn upwards all the time into the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because if we're left alone, we'll surely sink and we'll fall deeper and deeper and deeper. We must be sure that we're abiding in him. Experiencing that, that upward draft, that upward pull of his kingdom. And you see, let me say it again. Your new King James says there that the iron floated. The old King James says the iron did swim. You see, friends, listen to me, please. Any dead body can float. Have you got that? Half the churches in the country are dead, but they're still floating. Any dead body can float. But there's a miracle happening here. There's life has come to this dead piece of iron. And it swims. It rises in the water as the wood, as the stick or whatever you want to call it, is thrown into the water. There's life comes into that iron once again. And it rises to be reunited with where it should be and where it once was didn't float. It swam. Completely different. Completely different. Oh, friends, any dead body, any corpse can float. You see what I'm trying to say here? You've gone wild quiet. But you see what, do you see what I'm trying to say here? There's a miracle at work here. Something far more than you and I can possibly imagine. You see, how did Elisha do that? Again, let me say, he cut down a stick and he cast it into the place where the iron had fallen in. And something happened to the iron that caused it to swim, that caused it to rise. That dead piece of metal that could do nothing but sink to the depths was raised because of the stick. The stick's a foreshadow of the cross, and you know that. You know it is. 
Praise God today. Our Lord Jesus Christ came into this world to purchase our salvation. Our Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, shed his precious blood for us, and through repentance of our sin, praise God, and faith exercised towards him in a personal way. He has brought us into a relationship with him. He has brought us into a new kingdom. Hallelujah. And there's an upward draw. He's pulling us on to himself all of the time, giving us life just like this iron. Life where there is no life. Life where there shouldn't even be life. We're sinners. Isn't that right? But he gives us life. It's a picture of the cross. And you see, when we feel, whenever we foul up, whenever we fall, whenever those things happen, praise God, the power of the cross is such that he can lift us up again. Aren't you glad about that today? The power of the cross is such that he's able to keep us, even whenever we fall. Praise God, there is grace abundant to meet our every single need. Hallelujah! What would we do without that grace? And there is power always available to restore to us again that which we need to live for him and to be effective for him in his kingdom for his glory. Do you believe that? Our friends, what would we do without God's amazing grace? What would we do without that? And you see today, praise God, the cross, hallelujah, the cross is big enough, big enough to keep us, and the cross is big enough to cleanse us, and the cross is big enough to meet our every single need. Bless his wonderful and holy name. That's the power of the cross today. That's the power of our Savior. That's the God whom we profess to love and to know and to walk with. That's him today. And friends, I read the Acts of the Apostles. And I want to tell you something today. I want that power. Don't you? Can we settle for anything less than that? I read the Acts of the Apostles. And I want that cutting edge that the early church enjoyed. It made the work easy. Oh yes, there were problems. There was persecution. There was all sorts of stuff. But the salvation of souls, listen, it was an easy thing. Hallelujah. Whereas in church life today, it's the hardest thing that we can possibly see done. I want that cutting edge. I want to live on the cutting edge of the work of the Lord. Don't you? Can you settle for anything less? And you see, whatever it takes, you and I, I know I certainly do, I want that anointing. I want that power. And it's not for self-gratification. Friends, it's for the glory of His name. It's for the glory of His cross. It's for the glory of the one who laid down His life and shed His blood. Then you and I could be brought on to him and be made a part of that kingdom. And so we need to learn from the lessons of these verses. First of all, we must all work together. That means every single one of us should feel a part because every single one of us has a work to do. For some it will be witnessing. For some it will be doing outreach. For some it may be preaching. For others it will be in the place of prayer. For some it will be encouragement. When did you last encourage anybody? When did you last throw your arm around somebody's shoulder and said, you're doing a good job? Huh? You're doing a good job in Sunday school. You're doing a good job in Sunshine Corner. You're doing a good job in Oasis. When did you last encourage anybody? And you see, we all have different parts to play. Friends, listen to me. There's nothing like a word of encouragement. But we'd far rather pull each other down. And we may not do it deliberately, but the very fact that we don't do it at all. But we all have a part to play. Wherever, whatever, whenever, all of us have a part. We all have different ministries. But you see, the Lord has placed us all together. Isn't that sad? You have to put up with me. Well, you don't have to. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying there. The Lord has placed us all, all the different personalities. You're not like me. 
And you're saying, praise God for that. You're not like the person who's sitting across the aisle from you either. Because we're all different. But for some reason, God has brought us all together. Because every one of us is needed in this place to do what God wants us to do in this place. It's as simple as that. And whatever we're called to do, whether it be prayer, or whether it be witness, or whether it be outreach, or whatever, or encouragement, listen, we need a cutting edge in that. We need to be able to do it well. To do it in such a way that the person that we minister to will be blessed by it, and encouraged by it, or challenged by it, or brought to Christ by it, or brought their life closer, or edified by it. But we need to be in whatever ministry we're in, we need to have a cutting edge. Because the Lord has placed us together. You know, iron sharpens iron. And you're sharpened by the people that rub against you in this assembly. Simple as that. That's why he has us together in the first place. And so we need to examine ourselves and look to our own cutting edge. And you see, whenever our own cutting edge is right, the cutting edge of this fellowship will be right. It's then that it will be right. And our own assembly will have a good cutting edge and we'll see the work done for God. And this great house that God has purposed, friends, it will be built to the honor and to the glory of his great and wonderful name. Praise God today we have the cross. We have the message of the cross. We have the power of the cross. And we have the all-encompassing grace and mercy that flows to your life and mine of the cross. And even in these days, parlous days, barren days, we can look to the Lord and thank God the iron can swim. Hallelujah. Because the cross is still the power of God to meet every single need. Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise today for your word. And Lord, this is your word. Lord, it's not the word of somebody who stands in this pulpit and golders at people. But Lord, I believe this is a word from the heart of God to my heart and to everybody else's heart that's here. We pray today, Lord, you'll help us to rise to the challenge of that. And may our lives, Lord, show and may our lives tell the difference of the reality and the power of that at work in us. And so, Lord, to that end, we commit to each person to you today. We commit your word to you today. And in Christ, Father, we pray, cause it to be fruitful in each one of us for your name's sake and for your glory. And everybody said, Amen.